Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Charles Haynes, and uh, the hat I'm wearing this afternoon is I'm on the Board of Directors of the Character Education Partnership. Uh, and I'm very, very delighted to be the one to introduce our speakers today. Uh, it's a great privilege for me. Um, I will start by saying that today's session is two firsts for, I think, for the Character Education Partnership. The first first is that this is the first time in our history that we have had students as keynote speakers at our forum. The first but not the last, unless of course they're terrible, which will not, will not be the case. They're gonna be so good that they'll set, they'll set the high bar. Just kidding, guys. Uh, and the other first uh, this afternoon is that I think this is right. This is the first plenary session in the history of the Character Education Partnership that focuses on inclusion of students with intellectual or disabilities. I think this is the first time we've had a session on that issue. Uh, it won't be the last, but it's exciting that it's the first. Well, I'm gonna just, you have their bios. I'm not going to tell you all the things that they've accomplished because you see that in front of you and I don't wanna repeat all that, but I can't help but say a, a, just a few things about our speakers. Uh, Danielle LaBelle, I'm, see I'm gonna get it wrong. <laughs> Libol, Libol. See, I, she told me ahead of time how to pronounce it. I've known Danielle, but I've never said her last name out loud until today. So I knew I was gonna get it wrong. And I, and I lived up to that promise, didn't I? and Soren Palumbo, who's going, they're going to be our speakers. I'm going to say a few things about them. Uh, first to say this, that um, I encountered them, met them, uh, well, actually met Danielle first in Washington, uh, and someone told me uh, that day when I met you at Project Unify meeting, a leadership meeting, uh, that you had done a paper using some of my work in your paper, in the research paper, and I knew immediately that you were a brilliant and wonderful person. <laughs> Uh, but she, th then about a year later, we met at a Special Olympics uh, leadership, Project Unify leadership meeting in Nebraska. And I heard uh, Soren and Danielle speak together at the governor's mansion in Nebraska. And I knew that day that I would have to somehow find a way to get them to come to CEP because uh, I was new in the Special Olympics effort and Project Unify, and they helped me to understand what's at stake in this very important issue, which is, I think, one of the great civil rights issues of our time. Uh, so here they are today. And Danielle, of course, um, was a Special Olympics athlete, but went from that to saying, look, uh, we've got to do something, particularly in our schools. She had the courage to stand up and to be an advocate and an activist uh, on this issue and to get students involved and change that school climate. Uh, Soren has used his great leadership abilities to focus on this issue in some very important ways, as you can see in his bio. But he's really taken Special Olympics out of its usual understanding and taken it into different places, including colleges and universities, which is an extraordinary thing. So he's already had a tremendous impact. These two young people uh, their watchwords in their lives are service, compassion, leadership. Uh, they are people who are working for justice. So they're not like many young people you introduce or you encounter today. They're not people we call our future leaders. They are our current leaders. And they certainly have given that leadership in my life to bring home this important issue and I know they will in yours as well. With that, I give you Danielle and Soren. Thank you, thank you very, very much, Charles, and thank, thank you to all of you who are here with us this afternoon. I have, uh, I've known Danielle for a number of years, and I've learned never to follow her as a speaker, so I will, uh, I will take the first crack at it. Um, now, I want to start by saying, as, as someone who is inevitably phasing out of the category, I want to thank CEP and Charles for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts as a 
young person here with you today. And before I begin, I want to follow that with a bit of a disclaimer. Unlike many of you, and certainly unlike the other incredible speakers here this weekend, I am not a formally trained expert in the field of education, or in any field for that matter. <laughs> I cannot offer you any empirically tested or peer-reviewed theory on how to jumpstart the educational system or how to supercharge the classroom. I do not have experience as an administrator, and I have never led teams of teachers or principals or school boards. Like Charles said, I am a student, and I have been one for over 20 years. And at this point in my student career, I know just enough about law to misadvise you on any legal question that you may have. So I'll be more than willing to do that. I may not know much about law or education or much in between, but I do know about being a student and a young person. So it's observations on these two roles that I'd like to share with you this afternoon. In my understanding, education has the impossibly complex task of teaching. And at the same time, the impossibly simple directive of just do it better. The educational system is a product with an expiration date that simply reads yesterday. Whether it's a new student interacting with an old idea or an old student interacting with a new idea, Every young person places a burden on this system to adapt to his or her needs, to improve, to change. And some of these areas of improvement come with very quantifiable measurements. Test scores, love them or hate them, can give insight to how well a school teaches math or science. But of course, education does not end with math or science or reading or writing. Schools are also recognizing their responsibility of character education. And that's what brings us here today. They're beginning to grapple with this nebulous, but nonetheless critical task of character education. Unfortunately, perhaps, character education is something that has many more definitions than it does means of quantifiable measurement. Many of us especially those outside of the pertinent academic fields, are forced to rely on intuition when making judgments on character education. We know it when we see it, whatever it may be. Some factor rolled up in the equally ambiguous school climate. I'd like to offer you a story of two high schools in hopes that you will join me this afternoon on seeing it. I grew up in the Chicago suburb of Palatine, a mid-sized suburban town with two public high schools, one literally on each side of the railroad tracks that run through town. The two high schools, Palatine High School and Fremd High School, where I spent four years as a student, each have around 3,000 students and are both competitive in local sports. And though Fremd has a slightly more decorated academic reputation, each boasts a respected educational environment. These two schools, however, are by no means identical. And one of the largest differences between the two is the result of a district policy. The local high school district, the governing body for the five schools nearby, some time ago made the decision to concentrate its special education resources into two of the five high schools. Palatine High School is one of these. Fremd High School is not. As a result, Palatine High School has a special education department that serves several hundred special education students, students with intellectual disabilities and other special needs. Fremd High School, on the other hand, serves around one or two dozen students with significant IEPs. So what did this look like as a student in a school nearly exclusive of students with disabilities? Sadly, it was rather unremarkable. After all, we live in a world that likes to think of disability as aberrational, a deviance 
from the all dictating norms. Something best to be hidden away, left forgotten. And the school environment, a microcosm of the society around it, was more than happy to do just that, to leave it forgotten. And it could for four days of the week. Once a week, however, the bubble of exclusivity was threatened by that high school across town. You see, the employment training class of Palatine High School would send a small team of its special education students to Fremd High School once a week to work with the custodial crew in developing on-the-job skills and discipline. These students work as hard and take their task as seriously as any student does in the classroom, whether it's washing the windows or tending the hallways. But these students face a challenge that would bring many of us in here to our knees. As they are hard at work, the friend students passing by greet them with, hey, retard, you missed a spot. And as they walk away, these friend students snicker to themselves in what was known to most of the student body as the retard slave labor. Despite the ambiguities involved, it takes no expert in education to see that something has gone substantially wrong in this school's responsibility of character education, in this school's responsibility of building a more ethical climate. On the other side of town, Palatine High School has an elevator. The two-story school has classrooms on both its first and second floors and permits any student who can't use the stairs to use the elevator to get from class to class. With such a large special education department, Palatine High School has a number of students with complex disabilities who rely on the elevator to take them and their wheelchairs or even power chairs from class to class. On one fall day, after I had graduated from Fremd, the elevator of Palatine High School unexpectedly malfunctioned and would not respond to the buttons on either floor. A female student with cerebral palsy who used a power chair sat in front of the elevator and pushed the button over and over and over again, expecting it to come as she was told it always would. Step away from that for just a moment to a scene on the football practice field at Palatine High School weeks before, where the football coach was giving his team the annual preseason talk. Coach Donnelly, his team on a knee around him, spoke as you would expect about the on-field commitment to athletic excellence that would be needed to beat crosstown rival Fremd High School and to have a successful season. But he went on to talk to his team about a different commitment, a commitment to character excellence required of a football player at Palatine High School. In addition to practice and commitment on the field, the coach demanded a responsibility to community off the field. This came with a number of duties and behaviors expected within the school. One of these, the coach mentioned to his larger players, was to assist any students using wheelchairs should the elevator malfunction. Now, back in the hallway, the student in the wheelchair leaned forward again to press the button, and again the elevator did not come. But as she did, two members of the offensive line walked past. Without a second thought, these two varsity football players picked up the girl and her heavy power wheelchair and carried her up the stairs to her classroom. Without being told and without expectation of recognition, the two boys met this girl after her class and carried her and her wheelchair back down to the first floor. Now, despite the ambiguities involved, it takes no expert in education to see that something has gone substantially right in this school's responsibility of teaching character education. Something's gone right in this second school's project of creating an ethical community. So what is the difference between these two schools? 
What has caused them to have such divergent tales of character education? There is, of course, no single explanation, no one determinative variable, and chances are as many explaining theories as there are people in this room. That being said, I would like to offer a theory, if not an admittedly radical one. The difference between these schools is inclusion. And I propose that inclusion of students with developmental disabilities in the school climate is an invaluable part of character education. That is, inclusivity is not just a nicety for students with developmental disabilities to gain social skills and to integrate, though it certainly is that. Inclusive education is a powerful tool for character education of general education students. Inclusive education not only benefits the special education department of a school, but the character education of the entire student body. But why is that? After all, it would seem tenuous to say that the addition of more tall students would lead to character education, that the addition of more short students, white students, black students, purple students would lead to a greater character education. And I'm not offering an explanation by way of diversity or tokenism. In these two schools, some variable is affecting change and leading to character education and a more ethical community. And it seems to be inclusion. But again, why? Inclusive education leads to character education. Because character education, to submit another one of my own radical theories, is the teaching of the human condition, a pedagogical mission to answer the question, what does it mean to be human? That is, character education is the answering of the question, what does it mean to be this thing that we call a person? And more specifically, what does it mean to be this one that I call me? Is it a grade? Is it a look? Is it a social status? And like all elements of education, this lesson is taught through challenges, through problems. We learn who we are only through challenges to who we think we are. So then what is the greatest challenge to our conception of personhood? It is the population, we are told most vehemently, that does not deserve to be conceived as human. It is the population that society has worked hardest to mask under misconceptions of worthlessness and labels of hopelessness. It is the population our society has worked hardest to dehumanize people with developmental disabilities. Generations of intolerance have built a wall of ignorance and fear taller than any other around people with intellectual disabilities, effectively hiding and denying their humanity. The challenge to character education is to humanize the dehumanized. The greatest challenge to humanize the most dehumanized. Inclusion, especially in the school environment, gives young people the opportunity to take on this greatest of challenges to character education. Ostensibly small gestures, like a school showing that students with intellectual disabilities are not only a part of, but a priority of the school community, can sow the seeds of positive change in the minds of its students. But even more, inclusive education creates the opportunity for positive interaction between general education and special education students. The opportunity for social relationships built on reciprocity and respect. The opportunity for friendship. By allowing the humanizing effects of friendship, inclusive education plays a key role in character education. But those of you with any experience in inclusive education know that it is not a guarantee to improve character education, but perhaps a first step. That is, inclusive education does not lead to improved character education. Inclusion does well, done well, lead, leads 
to character education. Inclusion done well leads to character education. Sharing ability, sharing a building does not overcome dehumanization and thereby lead to character education. It takes interaction, positive interaction. Learning, whether it be of the Pythagorean theorem or of the self or of another, is a social process achieved somewhere in the reciprocities between student and teacher, between peer and peer. And to leverage inclusion, the enormously powerful tool of character education, we must enable, foster, cultivate the positive, genuine, and fun interactions between students with and without intellectual disabilities. And this is Project Unify, a Special Olympics youth engagement movement of inclusive sport, friendship, and advocacy. Project Unify is not inclusion. It is what makes inclusion better. Project Unify fuels the vehicle of inclusion, enabling it to reach its destination of character education and building ethical communities and beyond. And it does so by engaging young people with and without intellectual disabilities as co-participants in its inclusive programming, but even more so by empowering them to create and lead their own ethical communities of change. That is, Project Unify is not a product passively consumed by young people across the country, but rather an experience owned and created and implemented by activated leaders in school environments, whether that be in the elementary classroom all the way to the college campus. In all of these places, Project Unify is not only a service project that is a nice thing to do, Project Unify is an enormous tool for character education that is an important thing to do. I've worked with Project Unify since it began and have taken to heart their open call for youth-generated and youth-led innovation to improve inclusion both inside and outside the school environments across the country and around the world. Project Unify empowered me to vocalize the barriers I saw to inclusion and dignity for people with developmental disabilities and the ill effects that these barriers were having on the people around me without developmental disabilities. Project Unify enabled me to transform these observed problems into opportunities for positive change. And I'd like to share two of these opportunities with you. Since its beginning, Project Unify has been closely tied to the campaign to educate people, young and old, on the dehumanizing effects of the words retard and retarded. These words, especially the prejudices they crystallize, form the bedrock of the walls separating people with and without developmental disabilities. This, in the early time of Project Unify, was known as the campaign to end the R word, a generally top-down messaging campaign more concerned with scolding bad behavior with a punitive tone than it was concerned with generating positive and inclusive behavior. Taking note of this, I worked with another college student to reconfigure the campaign into a youth-led, grassroots, and positive movement known as spread the word to end the word. Spread the Word works, as did its predecessor, to collect pledges, commitments from individuals to end their hurtful use of the R word, a potent step towards rethinking and dismantling the divide between those with and without intellectual disabilities. Since its launch in 2009, Spread the Word has engaged young people as leaders at events at over 250 university and college campuses, at thousands of high schools, and thousands more elementary schools in the United States and on every continent north of Antarctica. By unleashing the power of youth-led grassroots change, 
Project Unify has enabled Spread the Word to collect well over 10 million handwritten, verbal, and digital pledges to reconsider the dehumanizing verbal divide that we face. This campaign, now in its third year, has given the opportunity for thousands of young people with and without intellectual disabilities to work together in the processes of character education to affect positive change in their schools and in their communities. Another opportunity I found with Project Unify that Charles alluded to was that despite its powerful program of engagement for young people from kindergarten through 12th grade, there was no organized effort to engage college students. Now, I was convinced that people ages 18 to 22 could be just as impactful as leaders and as learners. So I worked with the same college student to design Special Olympics College, an engagement and outreach program now a part of Project Unify. With a presence on do dozens of American college campuses, SO College challenges the traditional exclusion of people with intellectual disabilities from the university community and extends to college students this same opportunity to either begin or continue their character education. Speaking as the founder and former president of the Special Olympics Club of Notre Dame, I can say that college students are some of the most hungry to participate in those questions driving character education, to find the answers to questions like, what does it mean to be human? Project Unify through So College feeds that hunger and enables that education in life-changing and community-changing ways. The success of our club at Notre Dame and others similar testifies to this. In its first year, Special Olympics Notre Dame beat out over 200 other Notre Dame student organizations to be recognized as the most outstanding club of the year, the first club to ever receive this honor in its inaugural year. By bringing college students together with people with developmental disabilities as coaches, as teammates, and as friends, SO College and Project Unify are enhancing the character education of college students and enhancing the quality of life of people with intellectual disabilities in university towns and communities across the country. Now, I began by telling you that I was, more than anything, a student. And I stand by this identification, but maybe not in the way that you would expect. In my 20 years as a student, from preschool to law school, I've learned the answers to many questions, ranging from, can I eat this Play-Doh, to, having eaten it, can I sue Play-Doh? <laughs> but the answer to the most important questions didn't come from a high school teacher or a college professor. I learned what it means to be human from my younger sister, Olivia, a young woman, now almost 17, and a special education student at Palatine High School. She tells me that not only have the elevators worked without problem this year, but in a bragging tone, that Palatine High School crushed Fremd High School, my high school alma mater, in the annual Crosstown Rivalry football game. And I'll hear that for the rest of this year. The unconditional love and joy that Olivia shares with the world around her have taught me more than any class about what it means to be a person, and more importantly, what it means to be a better person. I live my life as an attempt to give back to her as much as she has given me. Project Unify gives young people the opportunity to learn these lessons in selflessness and character and ultimately to begin to pay back the population that teaches these lessons best, if only we let them. And with that, I'd like to turn to my more important responsibility, which is to introduce a good friend of mine, Danielle, who in ways that the rest of us can only aspire to, 
manifests and lives the mission of selflessness and being a better person and leverages the Project Unify mission of youth-led leadership and youth-generated positive change in her community and in communities across the country. So I'd like to ask all of you to join me in welcoming Danielle. Thank you. Well, when I first met Soren back in like 2009, I think it was, I was awestruck by him. I don't think I ever told him that before. And now I have the privilege of working with him as a colleague to promote and execute Project Unify, which is really a pleasure for me. I am not here today to talk to you about how necessary or valuable character education is, and I'm not going to tell you how to do it. Instead, I'm going to tell you my experience in high school and how that shaped me to be the person I have aspired to be today. But before I start, I want to start with a quote from Martin Luther King Jr., a very respectable civil rights leader of our time. He said, change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability, but comes through continuous struggle. So we must straighten our backs and work for our freedom. A man can't ride you unless your back is bent. Now, personally, I believe this is a perfect example of what needs to happen. But before I continue telling my story, I should probably introduce myself. I'm Danielle Liebel, a sophomore at College of St. Benedict, so I have not had the schooling yet of SORN yet. <laughs> Um, and I have been a Special Olympics athlete for more than nine years of my life. <sighs> During, um, at birth, I acquired a condition called cerebral palsy due to a complicated birth. And what cerebral palsy is, is it's a brain condition that affects your muscle control coordination and simple, simple movements such as standing, walking, talking, breathing, eating, and learning, and much more. Now, cerebral palsy is not only considered a physical condition, but also a, de a, a developmental condition as well. So, most of my life, I got told by professionals of what I can't do rather than what I can do. And for most of my high school career and even my middle school career, I was considered special ed. Now, as most of you know, special education does not have the best reputation among peers in high school. Um, my Fresh, thank you. My freshman year in high school, me and my parents both decided that it would be in the best interest for me to get a paraprofessional to help me with schoolwork in my class. And we've noticed that during, while I had my para, it hindered me from socializing with other classmates. Um, classmates, usually your peers, don't want to approach you when you have a pair because they feel uncomfortable about it. They feel, oh, maybe she's just not that smart. She needs a little extra help. Maybe we shouldn't talk to her. And as most of you know, special ed students aren't tended 
tend to be part of the popular crowd in high school with all those cliques. Um, I was not a fan. And they're not usually part of the homecoming court or queen, even though it's becoming more popular nowadays. But so after my freshman year of high school, I decided that socializing with my peers to me was more important than learning. And so I told my parents that I did not want to pair it anymore, but I'll continue going to my special ed classes. Um, like I said, students, um, they treat me differently when I had para. And this treatment tends to lead to, a, to bullying. And this was rather a regular occurrence for me. Personally, I got call names on a daily basis of stupid, ugly, or my favorite, because I think it's the most creative, four legs. I don't know how they came up with them with that. But so for a student with developmental disabilities, this is not of the ordinary. According to abilitypath.org, all studies found that students with disabilities were two to three times more likely to get bullied than their non-disabled peers. And this was one fact that led me to where I am today. Because those bullies, what they don't realize is even though we can't do the same things they can do, we can do some things actually better than what they can do. Um, so this, my junior year of high school, I got told by my Special Olympics coach that I was selected to attend the Special Olympics Youth Activation Summit in Boise, Idaho, where I met Soren. And these ideas, um, ideas kept rolling through my head on what I could do back home. And when I got back home, I proposed these ideas to my Special Olympics coach, and we sat down and I said, this is what I want to do. I want to change my school. And she asked me why, and I told her that one of my Special Olympics students had told me this. I hate it when I can't hang out with my friends on the other side of the building. Because in my high school, where I graduated from, the special ed classrooms were located on the totally opposite end of the mainstream classrooms. So we decided, we put our brains together, and with the ideas that I came back with, we decided to form a partners club. Um, a partners club provides an environment where students with and without disabilities can establish relationships as friends. The first year we had it, we had 15 students. So for a very small high school that I went to, this was a huge success. Due to this club, you can see the changes in the hallways. Students were high-fiving and conversing with each other. But most importantly, they considered each other friends. This set success provided me the confidence to found another club once I, once I proceeded to college. The Club of Students for the Advancement of People with Disabilities. This club follows the same structure as Partners Club, only it's geared more toward college students. With the added component of ad advocacy and education of people with disabilities. I go to a very small college where this is the first year they've ever had disability services. 
because my class was the highest class with um, a disabled population, and that population consisted of four students. So we felt it was a very important issue to address on our campus. So it was because of the voice I had in high school and in Partners Club that I really had the confidence to found this club. And one thing that we still do in, we call it SAPD because it's a mouthful. The one thing we do in SAPD that we also do in Partners Club was to spread the word to end the word event in our local high school, like Soren already spoke about. And we were even fortunate enough to bring it to our local middle school and various other local high schools. And we had great responses from students. Although this campaign was definitely a time where my back started to get bent. Not only, excuse me. <coughs> No. <coughs> Thank you. Excuse me. I'm not used to the weather change. I'm from Minnesota. <laughs> um so when we did this artwork campaign, um, it started to be a challenge. We, while doing a presentation, I actually had a friend who I thought supported me, but during actually advocating for this campaign, stood up and walked out of the presentation because he was not in support of it. And I also wrote an article for Teen Truth Live for Spread the Word to End the Word, explaining an athlete's perspective on how the word retarded is bullying. A few weeks later, Teen Truth Live posted a video on YouTube made by the Special Olympics Youth Activation Committee about unification. The f a few hours following, there was a post posted by an anonymous student stating this. The IRD campaign came to my school and made me want to shoot up my whole school. I was in shock and immediately went to my guidance counselor. From there, the police, YouTube, Special Olympics, and Teen Truth Lab were notified. It definitely was an experience that shook people up. This example shows that even though this movement has started and we are making progress, there's still a lot of change that needs to happen. But this change is ultimately up to the youth. They want to change and shape their future. They're the ones that want a voice. Are you willing to guide them? I want to tell a story that I originally hadn't planned on telling, but I sit on the board of directors for United Cerebral Palsy of Central Minnesota, and every year we give out awards. And one award that's given out is for an educator that has gone above and beyond helping a student that has cerebral palsy. And year after year, I'm seeing it given to a special education teacher, which is nothing wrong with that. They, they usually deserve it. But this year, we had change. It was a band teacher. And his student was a sixth grader, and she nominated him. She had cerebral palsy. And she always wanted to play the clarinet. This was her dream. And her mom was a music major and played the clarinet, and she wanted to be exactly like her mom. And so she went out by clarinet, 
and went to band to find out that she couldn't physically play the clarinet because of her muscle coordination and that her disability didn't exactly allow her to do it. So she got frustrated and told her mom that she wanted to quit. So her mom went in and even bought herself a clarinet to come in and play with her sixth grader. And Jackie, the sixth grader, was still so frustrated. So Jackie decided to go up to her band teacher and tell him that she, she was going to quit. She couldn't play this instrument. And so what he did was, I'm not going to let you quit because I know this is your dream and I know you can do it. So what he did was he did some research and found a clarinet that Jackie could play. It did have wind holes, but had buttons instead that would fit her fingers and her coordination. And not only did he find it, but he gathered up the funds from the community to buy it for her. And what I thought was so important about this was when accepting his award, he said that that award that he was given shouldn't even exist because he was a teacher and that was his job because every student has a dream and it was his job to provide them, the students, provide the students to help guide them to reach their dreams. And following that same note, one thing that I keep in mind as a student is something that one of my favorite high school teachers said that I still am good friends with today. And she told me once, I walked into her classroom and I'm like, Ms. Knightsling, I want to change this. Can you do it? You know the administration because they weren't really working in my favor to help with this, this one activity that the Partners Club wants to do. And she looked at me, sat me down, and she said, Danielle, as much as I want to make this world a better place for you, I can't. You have to do it yourself. If I did it for you, what kind of teacher would I be? I would not be teaching you that you can change the world. But always remember, I am always here to guide you. Are you willing to be that teacher for your students? Take a look around you at the brick walls built up all around. There are issues that are standing in our way to create a dignified life. Issues history never attempted to tackle. It is now that we, the students, say that we have had enough. We want equality for all people. It is now that we are putting new lenses on the world's eyes. We have started on a pathway with a desire, only to have that desire grow so that we can learn more. Together, let's learn and possibly even teach each other a few things. Because someday, our desire for social justice will become a reality. And when that day comes, we will be able to stand up and say that we have changed history. Please join the movement. When more people join, there's only one thing it can do, grow stronger. I am just one example of Project Unify and what Project Unify can do in the life of a student. But there are many more stories out there that will even make you aspire 
to make your students one. So together, let's straighten our backs and push the wheel of change. Thank you. Thank you.